When released in 1984, the Tatung Einstein had a whopping price tag of £499. That's around £1,600 in today's money. In our last video, we got this one working by replacing the failing power supply with a better, modern equivalent. We also replaced the jammed 3-inch floppy drive with a new old stop model, and then we turned our eyes to this tantalisingly empty second drive bay. We're going to modernise this Einstein using some new tech and some resin 3D printed parts. And we're going to do it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented makers designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. The Tatung Einstein was a high quality computer. The power supplies did have a tendency to die though, which is why we replaced this one in the last video. We retrofitted a brand new modern Meanwell PSU and it works a treat. In that video we used the RF output into the TV tuner which was quite good, but still less than ideal. We also replaced the very battered and broken floppy drive with a lovely new old stock unit donated by channel patron Simon Green. After which I went and bought a floppy disk off of eBay because, well, I can't help myself. It's apparently tested and working, so this will be a nice tester for after our upgrades. Today we're going to be building a custom GoTech unit with an OLED display, a rotary controller and an LED access light. This is an old GoTech board that I just had hanging around. It's not very powerful but it'll do the job. Channel sponsors PCBWay have really kindly produced a custom mount for our project. It's buried underneath a few PCBWay branded goodies. Life's tough eh? Who doesn't like post-its? And a tote bag to put it all in. Thanks PCBWay. And this is where we get to the good stuff. You see this mount is produced using a tough resin printing process and then finished in the factory for the best possible surface. Resin prints are often brittle but these are not. They even have a bit of flexibility and the detail resolution is much higher than FDM prints. I'm really pleased with how they've turned out. This design comprises of some of my tweaks based on a Creative Commons file I found on an FTP server years back and I can't find the creator's name so if it was you please let me know so that I can credit you. Apart from the USB-A for our thumb drive the mount also features a recessed rotary controller, a hole for an access LED and a sight for a 0.91 inch OLED display. The mount is based on the same size as the Amstrad and Sinclair 3 inch drives so we'll have a small gap at the top and bottom of the bay. I plan to move the floppy drive from drive 0 to drive 1 and make our GoTech drive 0 the primary drive for the computer. PCB Way have really done us proud with these prints. They're dimensionally accurate and they really fit together nicely. If the gap at the top and bottom of the bay really annoys me, I'll end up just 3D printing some kind of bezel. I've already flashed the GoTech with the latest flash floppy firmware by Keir Fraser using his excellent wiki. There's some really simple instructions there. All we really need to do is work out the best way to put this together and maybe form a plan of action. I think wiring all the fiddly things to the front panel first would be the best course of action. So let's start with the rotary encoder. 
This is pretty standard stuff and comes with everything you need in the packet. It's also got some handy dandy pin labelling but that's not really going to help us and you'll see why in a moment. Although all this labelling is rather nice, I'm afraid we can't use it. The reason is that this board is kind of surplus to requirements because on the rear of the board we've got some pull up resistors which we could work around but to be honest it's easier just to remove the board. So let's fire up that Moo gun. It's a fairly low effort task to remove the encoder itself from the board. Well, with a desoldering gun it is anyway. If we were to leave the board in place then it's likely our encoder wouldn't register properly with our GoTech. Well not without perhaps wiring 5 volts up to the voltage input pin. So this is a much cleaner solution. Bye. Another little issue we've got is the registration pin on the front of the case of the encoder. That's there so you can slot it into a case to stop it rotating but that's not an issue for us so we're going to flatten it down so that the back of our case mount will fit nice and flush. Perfect. And that leaves just enough thread for us to get our nut on. Let's actually cinch that up with a proper tool. Nice and tight. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Now we've detached our encoder and we've put it in the mount, that will need to be glued into the front bezel itself. Let's do that right now. My glue of choice for resin prints is Gorilla Super Glue Gel, although this has gone off a bit so it's a bit runnier than I'd like. Gorilla Super Glue doesn't seem to have the same kind of crazing properties where the vapour leaves a white surface mist, so I'm pretty happy to use it on this. In she goes. And just make sure that's centralised. And let's leave that to dry. And whilst that glue's setting, let's relocate the drive access LED from the GoTech board itself. We're going to desolder it and then attach two wires so that we've got enough reach to get it through that hole on the front of our mount. We don't strictly need to do this, but I think it'll be a nice touch to be able to see when the drive's being accessed in real time. I'm going to use some 26 gauge silicon coated multi-strand wire. The colour's not tremendously important because the next person to look inside this machine well, no one will. The next thing that will happen to this machine is it will get thrown into a skip the day after I die. Thanks Mrs Fix's stuff. I'm not even going to tin these, I'm just going to pass them straight through the board. Then with a bit of our favourite smurf poo, handily given to us by the gummy crew. I'll hold the wires into position so that they don't come out of the holes when we flip the board upside down. Just a little bit of solder and Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt and Steve's the man who drives the milk float. You've done a good job there Smurf Poop. For the end that's going to be soldered to the LED let's pre-tin the wires. It's going to be tricky enough getting it to stick to the leads of the LED, so I don't want to take too many chances. We'll solder things to the front bezel when that glue's set, so for now we'll deal with things still on the board. There's the KC30 header, but first we're going to remove the header pins, which we're going to connect our OLED to. Again, this is a fairly simple task with our Moo gun. A quick tug, 
and it comes off nicely. We need to clear the holes in the KC30 header. Not all GoTech boards have this handy header for the rotary encoder, just some of the later models. Again we'll poke our wires through the board. Then we'll use some of our amazing smurf dung to hold them in place whilst we solder them from the underside. Plop. Soldering this board isn't actually too bad. They're definitely made for speed of soldering. So that's the wires we need for our rotary encoder soldered into the board. Nice and easy. Now let's deal with soldering up that LED before we go any further. I'm clipping the legs really short so they don't get in the way of anything so be sure to remember that the cathode is denoted by the flat side on the LED case. And that was a real pain to solder. It's ugly but it will work so we'll leave it at that. The wiring for our OLED display is up next. Again this is a pretty standard part, a 0.91 inch OLED display. You can find all the details about what parts you need in the hardware mods section of Keir Fraser's Flash Floppy Wiki. Using the same procedure we poke the wires through the board, solder them up and then by referring to the wiki we can wire the corresponding pins up to the corresponding pins on the display. Smurf poo failed a bit there but the jobs are good in. The four points to solder on the OLED consist of ground, power and the two data inputs required to get the information to the screen. I'm soldering them from the back so that it slides into our mount nicely. This is a really easy job. Mind my fingers though. Fingerprints. Lovely. I've checked, the glue is set so it's time to wire up our rotary encoder. Again the pinouts are shown really clearly on the flash floppy wiki. So I won't bore you with all this wiring. Let's just do it in the snap of a finger. And there we are. You'll notice that the two earths are bound together, that's because they don't share a common ground within the encoder itself. This is looking pretty good, so I'm quite pleased with how it's going. It's very firm and the glue set well. The LED goes into the hole and we need some way to keep it there. It's just a light piece so I think that we'll use some hot glue. We'll also need to use some hot glue on this knob because it's slightly larger than the shaft itself. Oh, hot's not to the rescue. A small amount of glue on the LED should hold it in position. And giving my screen a clean, we're going to slide it into the case. I'm using a small amount of isopropyl alcohol here just to break down any fatty fingerprint residue. With that clean, let's slide it into the case. To stop it moving around, I'm going to use some more hot snot. Just a dab at the top and the bottom should be enough to secure this light item into place. And the LED came out. That was a bit rubbish, Mark. 
Second time's the charm. I hope. A tiny dab on the end of this shaft and then pop my knob on, hold it central, and that should be a good fit. Once the glue's set, I'm pretty pleased with the action. It clicks nicely too. Okay, this is all wired up. The front panel's all wired up. What we need to do now is put the bottom of the mount into the front of the mount and bolt them together. I've already put some captive nuts into the side of the bottom of the mount. I only had hex bolts, but they'll be fine. It's just for securing the mount inside the drive bay anyway. We'll use a couple of handy self-tapping screws to hold the GoTech board into the bottom of our mount. Like any good fixer, I have some on hand. These are M3 and I think we're going to use the 6mm long ones. We don't want them to poke too far through the bottom of the mount. They're gripping really well. This resin is great. Other resins I've tried have shattered when I've attempted this. And they've ended up pretty flush to the bottom of the mount as well. Nice. We're going to take the front of our mount and the rear of our mount and try to mate them. Once the front's in position, we can get some more self-tapping screws and fix them together. That's actually a really, really tight fit. I like it. They protrude a bit further through than I'd like, but we can use shorter ones this side. I don't want to risk removing those screws and then trying again, with this being a 3D print. I don't want to wear out the holes. And there we have it our completely assembled GoTech. I hope it works. It'll look really silly otherwise. Not that I don't already. With our GoTech ready to go in as drive zero, it's time to move our existing drive over to the drive one position. With magnetic media dying at a daily rate, I just think it's a good idea to keep working from digital copies if at all possible. That's why I'm going to install the drive for the magnetic media as drive one to allow us to archive disks, but I'm also just going to use the drive zero as the primary drive for loading data. That's a lovely drive. Now there's a panel here which we need to remove. This is a great design, it's just one screw and then we've got access to this lovely drive bay. And there we can see the difference in the height. I'm not sure if it's going to bother me or not yet though. We'll also need to make provisions for the second drive by replacing this cable. And of course, we'll need a second power cable. I bought this cable from eBay. It's specifically been made to accommodate the existing drive and a GoTech. It cost about £15 and I'll pop the link below. I did actually look into making my own cable, but I hate making cables and by the time I'd bought all the parts, it would have cost more than just buying the cable in the first place. I also bought this genuine drive power supply cable from the same seller that sold me the GoTech diskette. It was about £4. And I also bought this extender, which will transform the power connector to the format that the GoTech needs. They're always a struggle, aren't they? Okay, we should be ready to rock and roll now. We'll take out the original cable and we'll put it to one side because it is original. 
and pop in our brand new handy dandy 27 foot long cable. When you put it in the machine it actually starts to look really massive but it does go to the right places within the machine which um, other ones don't and I know because I bought them first and wasted my money. It's time to mount our GoTech. It's quite pleasing to see this fit into place. That gap might bother me, I'm not sure yet. We might have to see when the lid goes on. It tightens up into place nicely. With the resin being slightly flexible, it takes me a couple of tries to get it lined up but it's certainly not difficult. Once it's screwed in, the action on the button is pretty good. I'm going to need to change this jumper from S1 to S0 to determine it as the primary drive in the system. We plug our cable in, making sure that the red line lines up with pin 1 on the drive connector. And then we place our power cable into the main board. Connecting that to the power input on our GoTech. Now before we install our original floppy drive into bay 1, we need to change the drive select jumpers like we did on the GoTech. To do this, we need to take the case off the outside of the drive. There's four screws with shakeproof washers, and they're only finger tight, so they're easy to pop out. This metal sleeve isn't actually a part of the drive, but came with the Einstein. With the screws out, it simply slides off. We're looking for this bank of dip switches right here on the back. We don't want to touch anything on the larger bank of switches, but the small bank has DS printed above it, which means it's drive select. So we move the switch marked 0 to off and the switch marked 1 to on. Now that should identify itself to the system as drive 1, as opposed to 0, which will be the primary drive and our GoTech. I really love working on the Tatung Einstein, it's such a high quality computer. In fact that was its downfall, it was far too expensive and it was only adopted by software developers who developed for the cheaper systems on it before porting the code out the back into the target systems. Oh that looks really good there. Again making sure our cable's the right way up, we plug in our data cable and we plug in our power cable. This is annoying me. They're on the wrong sides. Ah, oh. OCD sated. Thank you. With our drives installed, I think we're nearly getting there. But there's one more thing I want to do. You see, on the motherboard, underneath our handily tidied cables, there's a bank of switches which will enable RGB output from the Tatung Einstein. But to do that we need a special cable, and that's where Retro Computer Shack comes to the rescue. This is an RGB SCART cable. It's been specially developed by Ian Priddy, who takes so much pride in his work that I'm happy to recommend him. It comes with not one, but two DIN connectors. The second DIN connector sucks voltage out of the board like a tiny little vampire in order to enable our RGB goodness to work on our screen. 
In technical terms, it takes the 5V RGB blanking signal from the analog port and passes it along to the SCART socket so that our television knows what mode to switch to. Perfect. Except for one thing. We need to tell the Einstein that it needs to output RGB signals. As it stands, it will output YUV signals. So we need to move these jumpers. Which should be an easy task. But they're a bit stubborn and they don't want to come off. I guess they've sat there for 30 years, so they might be stubborn in their ways by now. But with a bit of can-do attitude and some judicious editing when my tool slipped off of the jumpers, we can get it done in one go. And it's done. Exciting times. This plate will hold our PSU in place. I took it off in the last video and I hadn't put it back because I knew we'd be doing this work. It's basically held in by two self-tapping screws. We do them up just tight enough so that the plate can move, then we slide it back. With it slipped back in this position, we can hook the PSU onto the rear pegs, drop it into the case, then push the plate into the case of the PSU. Of course, the next thing we need to do is do those screws up so it doesn't wobble about and the PSU doesn't flop around the machine like a drunken bull in a china shop. Bull secured. Of course, not forgetting to plug the power supply into the board. That would be embarrassing. Tempting fate somewhat, we put the case back together. Yes everyone, I'm that confident. I think I can live with that gap, but I might still make a bezel. What do you think? We're going to use my test LCD once again. Apologies, but I really can't get the OSD to disappear from my Trinitron. It's a big problem now and I've bought several remotes. And our RGB SCART input is working. That's a fantastic result so far. Our digital disk drive is also working. And it looks fantastic. I'm really pleased. But we will need some software. Luckily, I have this small SanDisk 32GB thumb drive, which is about 10,000 times larger than I need for the entire Einstein library. Let's pop it into the drive. Immediately Flash Floppy recognises the drive images on the drive, which is brilliant. It's just a FAT32 formatted thumbstick and all I've done is copy the images across using Windows Explorer. Now to check that our jumpers have worked and this drive presents itself as drive zero. We've inserted the drive on the Gotex and now we press Control Break. And happily we see some track action happening on the flash floppy. And the drive access light's working as well. An aggravator boots up. That looks pretty good. And sounds pretty, well, annoying. But, you know, I'm just happy for any result at this point. For all its posturing, Aggravator turns out to be, well, a fairly competent Pac-Man clone. I played it for about 10 minutes, it wasn't bad at all. Now let's check to make sure our floppy drive is presenting as Drive 1. And that works fine as well. This is pack-in software, so I wasn't expecting too much. But to be honest, this breakout clone kind of grabbed me. 
I'm not usually very good at these games, but the rhythm of this and the speed just seem to match my gaming personality. But that's enough of that. Now we've done all that hard work, why don't we explore some of the Tatung software library. First up, we're trying Starquake, and it's looking fairly familiar to be honest. The font, the graphics, even the sounds, everything just screams Spectrum. This is obviously a port, not really what I was looking for to show off the system's capabilities. So I explored further. Next we found Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. This is one of those isometric games that the ZX Spectrum did so well. And I've got to say I was hard pressed not to think I was playing another ZX Spectrum game, albeit with a really nice keyboard. I actually found myself a bit baffled as to what to do, but I suppose I should have just read the manual. No clue. Next up, I thought we'd go for Chucky Egg. Chucky Egg's one of my favourite games. It's just really fluid, fast-paced, but not all versions are created equal. I'm happy to say that the Einstein version is great, the physics feel spot-on, the speed is phenomenal, and it's really responsive. Next up was Disco Dan. After an eternity flying through the asteroid field, we got to the really uninspiring game that lies beneath it. I would have played this one a bit longer, but I must admit, I got a bit bored. No introduction is necessary for this game, it's Elite. I played Elite for around 20 minutes, which really isn't that long for this style of game. But in that time I realised that it was a really good port, whilst not really showing off any of the Tatting Einstein's specific capabilities. Fairly standard stuff. One of the games that seems to get mentioned everywhere for this system is called Gronks. You run around a maze and hoard gold, um, kill Gronks I assume they are, and then run the gold back to your gold collecting area. It was quite a lot of fun, but didn't really inspire me as anything more than a souped up ZX81 title. Then we moved on to the Konami Disc Arcade. This is where things changed up a gear. Kings Valley for a start looked much more like its MSX version and I suppose when you think about it the Tatting Einstein has quite a lot in common with the MSX. The gameplay was fast and furious and I couldn't actually get off screen one which is something I can do quite easily on the other versions. The mummies just seemed particularly aggressive in this version. It's really hard. This is very hard actually. See, I told you. Next we moved up to Yiya Kung Fu. This is a game that I remember from my childhood on the Acorn Electron and trust me, this is the far superior version. The only problem is, is that once again, it's really, really difficult. I could barely land any hits on my opponent, um, what's his name? I'm not actually sure what his name is. Is it written down anywhere? <clears throat> I'm saying nothing. That was an amazing day spent with the Tatting Einstein and I'm really looking forward to exploring some more of the software library. If you know any good games, please let me know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching and an extra big thanks to my amazing Patreon supporters. My channel is driven by my patrons and the more support I get, the more videos I can make. I really appreciate every single donation, big or small. It helps me so much. Look at them, they're all so lovely. What an amazing bunch of people. And so handsome too. They've got amazing hair and the most glowing skin. Why don't you go and watch another one of these videos? Go on, you know you want to. Come on, I'll see you there. Bye.